Bruce, how's it going? <laughs> All right, we made the connection. This is always the hardest part of the trip, and now yeah. that this is done, this makes it real easy for me. Yeah, well, awesome to see you, my man. How's things going? Uh, things are wonderful, of course. Life is pretty great. How is it, how's it with you? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Very good. It's uh, it's it's uh, been a great day, actually. I'm based in London, and I'm Gareth. Um, oh. And uh, Craig morning, in Australia, so um, he's just woken up himself. But everything yeah. is fine and dandy, my man. It's really cool to see your face. And <laughs> We're really <laughs> excited to chat to you. <laughs> oh, all right. Craig, you're up and early this morning. All right. Yeah, Australia's uh, cooling down a little bit, which is exciting. It's been uh, pretty warm out here. <laughs> yeah, well, it's cooling down here in, in Kiwi land. That's why I'm looking to go back to California soon so I can have the warm weather again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's good. In search it's good of warm. Soul. <laughs> I, oh, a absolutely. And Gareth, uh, Things in London uh, warming up for you? Yeah, the, well, it's today's actually been a bit chilly, but the, the cool thing is, is the clocks went forward last weekend, so the sun is up later at night and summer is slowly coming, so looking uh, forward. Yeah, <laughs> that's different than Game of Thrones where winter is coming. <laughs> 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 no, I'm open to everything. This is, you know, hey, this is a time, it's all on the table today, you know. We're starting a new world and uh, that... Uh, hiding things in the back is only something that'll catch up with you later. So let's just keep it all out in the front. And uh, that's what it is. That's true. <laughs> that's the way to be. Anything, you know, I've watched Let, you on so many videos and things. Yeah. And I'm just like, no way. Is there he is? <laughs> well, I, I'm real happy to be here with you guys because um, uh, first of all, every opportunity that we get to speak to the world at this moment is really important because the world looks totally crazy. Uh, yeah. And it is, is because uh, we're undoing a civilization as we're building a new one. So we're in the middle of one coming down and one coming up. And uh, mm -hmm. for most people, they're, they're, they have no idea of what's going on. So all they mm -hmm. see is the immediate chaos and go, what the yeah. hell is going on? You know, and it's like, yeah. no, nope, this is, we're right on schedule. Things are <laughs> <Yeah>. working. <laughs> Alrighty, we are here with the man, Bruce Lipton. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I want to thank you guys, Craig, Gareth. Thank you so very much for this opportunity to speak to your wonderful community because those people listening represent the cultural creatives, people looking for answers outside the conventional box, and perhaps we have some answers today. <laughs> awesome. We're looking yeah. forward to that. Totally. Yeah. Craig and I still can't believe that we're chatting to you. So it's, we watched you on so many videos and listened to you on so many things. So it's not like, woo. It's amazing. Well, I hope I don't bore you now, now that you've heard all that. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so Bruce, actually, um, I actually saw one of your keynotes um, some time ago in Dublin and it certainly changed the way that I think about our health and, and basically the way we take responsibility for our health. And uh, so I'm you know, really eternally grateful for the change in my thinking at that time. Uh, so, so yeah, thanks for that. Well, I, I appreciate that. I also appreciate the kind of work that you're doing because what we really have to understand is that um, the involvement of going into the body and trying to fix it, put your hands in there and put drugs and chemicals in there is bypassing the super intelligence that already exists. Uh, and we're not that smart. The cells are smarter than we are. I, I always like joke about it because people think, oh, everything's smaller or less than a human is less intelligent. And as you go down, there's less and less intelligence. Then you get to the cell and somebody goes, what kind of intelligence could they have? And the biggest joke in the whole world is that we're a community of 50 trillion cells. The cells created us yeah. with <laughs> technology that we can't even do yet. So uh, uh, a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, support uh, and acknowledgement of the intelligence of yeah. the cells. That 100%. 100%. Couldn't agree more. So, so Bruce, um, according to your work, our early years are really important to the patterns, basically, that we create in our subconscious, uh, subconscious minds. Uh, and that basically can affect us later on in our lives. So what were the early years like for you growing up in, in New York? Well, uh, I grew up like now I find most families, a lot of dysfunction in the family of some kind or other. Uh, and you have to recognize that a child, uh, let's understand why we have to 
do recording of uh, programs in the first seven years of life. Uh, uh, simply this, you buy a brand new computer and you open it up and you can turn it on, but if you don't have a program in there, then what good is it? You can't do anything with it. So first you have to install programs and then once you have the program, you can open a program and you can modify it and do whatever you want later on. But without any program, uh, there's nothing there. So uh, a child is born, the computer brain <laughs> is ready to work, uh, but it needs programs. And so the first seven years of our life, the brain is operating at a lower level than consciousness. In, in EEG, electroencephalograph terms, uh, the brain is operating at a vibrational frequency called theta. Theta is imagination. That's why kids below seven can mix the real world and the imaginary world. Uh, they're, they're on a broom. The mother says, give me the broom. The kid is saying, what broom? Because he's on a horse. And he's, you know, it's a real horse, but in that's imagination. Or a tea party where they pour nothing into the cup and then they drink the nothing and say, oh, how wonderful the tea was. Uh, that is theta in operation. <laughs> But theta is also hypnosis. And so the significance is the last trimester of pregnancy through age seven, the brain is operating predominantly in theta, uh, theta being hypnosis, meaning what? A child through age seven is observing the world like a video camera. Everything they see, everything they hear is going into the uh, brain, not into the conscious mind because that's not functioning yet. It's being downloaded as programs in the subconscious mind. And this allows us to get off the ground. Uh, in other words, uh, if, if you say, how many rules does it take to be a functional member of a family or a community? My God, you'd have to have a book with how many different ways to respond to the world and all that. I said, how does an infant going to learn the rules so it can be a functional member? And the answer is, it doesn't have to read anything. All it has to do is see and hear. <laughs> and it will download all the programs. Uh, this course would have been great in college if we could have used that a lot. It would save a lot of time for us, but uh, first seven years, this is the principle. And so the significance is, where do we get the basic programs that we operate from? And the answer is in the first seven years, we download these behaviors by observing other people copying theirs. Mm. So we look at our mother and our father, observe their behaviors, uh, and that becomes a program of how to be a mother and a father and a community and all that. Uh, and the problem, as we now know, is 70% or so of those programs are disempowering programs or beliefs that limit us or sabotage us. Uh, and, and they were put in because the people we copied them from didn't know any better anyway. So we, mm. if they had a dysfunction, then we copied that dysfunction. Uh, and it's this profound. Um, they looked at the fate of children adopted into families where there's cancer running in a family. And what did they find out is that the adopted child will end up with the same probability of getting, getting the family cancer uh, mm. as any of the natural siblings. But the program says, well, wait a minute. Uh, the adopted child came from totally different genetics. I go, yep. And why is this relevant? The cancer wasn't in the genes. The cancer was a, a, a problem of programs that were disempowering and sabotaging that we acquired by being in that family. So uh, go back to me. Yeah, there was some dysfunction in my family. Uh, uh, my mother and father, my father came from an old world. My father came from a world where marriage was uh, not because of love. Love was just, maybe you get that in your life, but marriage was because it was a business, as my father would say, meaning mm -hmm. Two people uh, back in, uh, you know, 1900, 1910, uh, living in Russia only could survive if they worked as a team to, to manifest a mm. life. So uh, I remember when I, you know, suggested to my father, I was thinking of getting a divorce. And he looked at me and said, divorce? No, oh, marriage is a business. You, you know, that's a business. I thought, well, that's an old world belief. <laughs> and, uh, and thank God that uh, we're not in that. But that's the kind of programming I grew up with. So basically, what does it mean? My programming of how to be in a good relationship was altered by watching my father and mother in their relationship. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I was operating uh, my life, uh, it was predicated on an awareness of relationship that I downloaded. And if that was dysfunctional, which it was, then everything I was doing uh, was dysfunctional because I was using the same program. Mm. Uh, and now people out there are going, well, <laughs> why do you use the program? Uh, and here's the point. 
uh, there are two minds, so we need to get this right away fixed up. And that is there's a conscious mind, which is connected to our personal identity. And there's a subconscious mind, which by definition is just a record playback program. So the first seven years, I put programs in the subconscious mind. But after age seven, I get to use the conscious mind, which is the great creative mind. And I go, well, this is really great. I can then create what the hell I want. I don't have to follow the program. I go, yeah, that's true. Except uh, people don't realize this, is that when we are thinking, the conscious mind lets go of the control of what's going on in the world because the thought is on the inside. So if I say, hey, tell, tell me what you're doing on uh, uh, Thursday at two o'clock, if, if you're looking around for the answer, I go, the answer's not outside, the answer is inside. Mm. What am I doing on Thursday? So I'm thinking. Well, the problem is the moment I'm thinking, I'm not paying attention to what's going on. So it's interesting, if you're walking down the street and you have a thought, it doesn't mean you walk into a tree or walk off the sidewalk, or if you're driving the car and you're mm -hmm. thinking, it doesn't mean you crash your car. I go, well then, it, who's paying attention? If my conscious mind is going inwards, who's looking at the road? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it turns out, subconscious is autopilot. So as we think, any job that's going on, any awareness that's necessary for our survival is now handled automatically, autopilot, subconscious. Well, that's where the programs that I got from other people are. So when I am thinking, I'm not playing my behavior that I want. When I'm thinking, I default to the program in the subconscious. Hmm. And I go, yeah, but that program wasn't my wishes and my desires for life. That was just copying my parents. So here's the the big, most important lesson for everyone out there to listen at this moment, and that is this. We are only conscious about 5% of the day. 95% of the day, our conscious mind is busy thinking about what happened yesterday, what's going to happen in the future, what I need to do, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I go, yeah, but that means then 95% of the day, you're not operating from your creative conscious mind, which has your wishes and desires, health, happiness, relationships, great job. I say, oh, that's conscious wishes, mm. conscious desires. I go, but that's only 5% of the day. 95% of the day, we are operating from the programs. And, mm -hmm. and here's the part that really screws us up is because conscious mind is not observing as we're playing these subconscious programs, then if we have a negative program and we're expressing it, conscious mind doesn't see it. Conscious mm -hmm. mind's busy thinking. So whatever program is coming out 95% of the day, we don't really observe it. Uh, and uh, I could summarize it with a story I've said, I've given 30 years the same story because it <laughs> works. And that is this, uh, you have a friend, you know your friend's behavior very well, you happen to know your friend's parent. And one day you see your friend is expressing the same behavior as their parent. Uh, and then you, so you want to tell your friend, of course, you know, it's like, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. <laughs> and then you back away from Bill because Bill goes totally ballistic, as Gareth <laughs> understands right now. Bill goes ballistic. How can you compare me to my dad? I'm nothing like my dad. And everyone laughs. Why? Because they've had this experience. And I say, two points, most profound story in the whole world, just from that. And point number one. Everyone else can see that Bill behaves like his dad. It's Bill who doesn't see it. I go, well, how does that happen? I go, because A, he downloaded that behavior in the first seven years of his life. B, 95% of the day he's thinking and automatically playing this behavior. And C, because his conscious mind's not watching the behavior, it's inside thinking, Bill doesn't even see the behavior. Mm. So, and, and so basically, that's the point. Uh, he, he says, I'm nothing like my dad, and everyone else can see that he is. Mm. Uh, uh, and that's because we play these programs all day. So that's profound point number one. Now, everybody get ready, sit down, hold on, because <laughs> profound point number two is this. We are all Bill. <laughs> Every <laughs> one of us is doing this all day long. And so this is why problems arise in life, because you have great wishes and desires, and then you try to you know, get to those wishes and desires. Then you find life is a struggle and it's hard and stuff doesn't come so easy and you sweat over making it happen. Uh, and then we, we look at the world and go, gosh, I wanted to be successful, but apparently the universe isn't helping me because I didn't make it. Hmm. Uh, and then I say, stop for a second. Guess what? 
the universe was going to give you everything you were thinking about. The unfortunate part is 95% of the day you were operating from a negative belief, just like Bill, and 95% of the day you are, uh, you know, if you don't have a program supporting what you want, the existing program will sabotage what you want. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, inevitably, anything that we really struggle to find, whether it's a relationship, a good job, uh, health, whatever you're looking for, and you're struggling to manage to get it. Is it because the universe doesn't give it to us? That's our perception because we don't even see we're involved. We just see the result. I'm not successful. And therefore, must be the universe is the problem because I want to be successful. It's not happening. Therefore, the universe, uh, you know, I'm a victim. That's mm. what we got to clear up. You're not a victim of the universe. If anything, you're a victim of your subconscious programs mm. and then all of a sudden why is that important because if i perceive i'm a victim of the universe then i say oh uh, i have no control it's just what happened to me so mm. therefore that's life but then when we understand wait i am manifesting this then all of a sudden i go from victim to the opportunity to be master because if i'm manifesting it then why can't i manifest something different the answer is yes you can mm. but you have to recognize uh, the conscious creative mind, which will manifest that new belief, is still only working 5% of the day, no matter how much awareness your conscious mind has, how knowledgeable it is, how many books you've read of self-help, how many lectures and videos. I say, that educates the conscious mind. The original programs, they're still in there. So no matter how smart the conscious mind gets, if you don't change the subconscious program, then 95% of the rest of your life is really not coming from your wishes now, but it's coming from the program. And that's why we look at life as a struggle. Mm. When it turns out, no, we're only fighting our own belief. <laughs> that's where the problem comes from. And it's invisible. And that puts us back into the position, oh, it's not me. It's the universe that's not helping me. I go, we have to become victims again. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's so many things there, like, wow, um, with what you just said. So it's like so much to take in, I guess, for everybody. And it's interesting what you said about like being like our parents and stuff, because literally this week I was having a conversation with Craig. I was going, yo, my sister's so much like my mom, but she would deny <laughs> it for like <laughs> her own eternity. You know what I mean? And then um, there's so many things, I guess, of like I've said about maybe my parents in my life that I would never do. And now I find I'm starting to do some of those things, you know. <laughs> there's that subconscious that, the, mind. <laughs> it's very interesting because most of the time, like Bill, we don't see that we're playing the program. But let's just acknowledge Sometimes we stop the thought and then come back into a consciousness looking, uh, you know, because before when we're thinking consciousness was back here. But the moment we start thinking consciousness then steps up to the wheel, looks out the window, and guess what? It catches the tail end of the behavior that was running mm. while we were thinking. And then we see ourselves and go, oh my God, I was just like my dad. Oh, oh my God, I was just like my mom. <laughs> you only saw it at the very end, but the damn thing was playing the whole time. Yeah. So, uh, but we do occasionally have insight to see that, wow, that, that's not the way I wanted to do it. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. So when, when they talk about only using 5% of your brain, like there's some sort of uh, truth to it, I guess, in some sort of way when it comes to the subconscious and conscious mind well, in a way. Well, it, it basically says uh, we, we use 5% uh, it, it allocating time. 5% is allocated to the conscious creative mind. 95% is allocated to the subconscious program. How much of the brain we use? Uh, there's an old history story that says, oh, we only use 10% of our brain. Oh, I spent a long time trying to find where the heck did that belief come from? Mm -hmm. uh, and then, but basically as a, as a cell biologist and histologist, uh, the first thing that came to mind is, oh, wait, the brain, 10% uh, of the brain is neurons and 90% of the brain are support cells called glia. I said, oh, well, yeah. If you look at the idea that neurons are the only functional cell in the brain, then by definition, we use 10% of the brain because 90% is the supporting material. <laughs> uh, but that story falls out the window because modern science reveals that that other supporting material is all integration and connectivity. So all of a sudden, we're not using 10% of the brain. We're using the whole brain. Mm. Okay? 
but not all the time because it depends like which part you want to activate, what you're thinking about, what you want to do. So uh, we have access to the whole brain and we could use the whole brain, but sometimes we only focus on some aspect uh, and then don't use the whole brain. But the whole idea that we use 10% of our brain uh, is not factual in that regard. Yeah. It, it is only represented that 10% of the brain is neurons, uh, mm. but you must include the other 90% because they're integration. For sure. Yeah. And, and just coming back to your youth, uh, Bruce, um, ah! we, we met, we met, you mentioned, the, I read somewhere that Einstein was sort of a childhood hero for you. Well, why was he? Well, first of all, because here's a man who, you know, because look, when you grow up as a kid uh, and young guys, especially, right, it's all sports teams. Who's, uh, who's uh, the best footballer, you know, who's the best this and that. And, and all these are the icons of sports for young people. And, and for me, when I saw Einstein uh, uh, and this like grandfatherly guy who was kind of funny, and I did see him, you know, in the sense that I was old enough to see him before he died. Uh, <laughs> and I saw this guy and I thought, here's a guy who was respected around the entire world, not for sports, but for being intelligent, <laughs> which is a completely different game. Uh, and, and to see a guy who was funny uh, and grandfathery and wise as anything could be, that was my equivalent of a sports hero. That's the guy's like, oh, wow, that guy's great. And I wasn't the only one who said that. All around the world, they said that. So mm. uh, maybe if you want, you know, you want to grow up, you could be a sports guy. Or maybe you could grow up and be a brainy guy. It, you, can, you can get there either way. For sure. Yeah. Such an amazing person, Einstein. You kind of, you can't, you almost can't believe that he was like around like so recently and he just discovered all these amazing things. Um, truly exceptional person. So, uh, of course, our podcast is about understanding you a little bit, which is why we're just asking you a few questions about you. And we know that, yeah. uh, you know, your parents fought a lot as uh, when you were a child, and, and but they stayed together uh, for the kids, actually. So that's not an uncommon, that's not yeah. uncommon, Garrett. That is, that is uh, every time I hear a lot of people talk about, that, oh, yeah, they waited until we were old enough to leave the house. And I go, uh, <laughs> the fact is, well, oh, so you're going to just, you know, damage us until that point. It's like, yeah. you know, if you leave earlier, we can get a fresh start. <laughs> mm, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's quite sad, I guess, how why parents do that. Um, yeah, in a way. And um, it's just... Well, yeah. it's sad because like Bill, they do this without them even knowing they're doing this because to them it's just automatic behavior anyway. They don't see it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, I wasn't born uh, in a Christian religion, but it's interesting because um, the most profound words that I, I can say right now regarding the, the foundation of Jesus and his teachings is that uh, on this last day on the cross, on the last moment, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Hmm. And I go, man, that's exactly <laughs> applies to everything we're doing here. Because if the parents are being bad parents uh, and, and just terrible parents, uh, and we want to blame them. And I say, you know, you have to forgive them because they themselves don't even know that they're doing it because they're just playing the same program that they got from their parents who got it from their parents uh, and perpetuate this problem uh, and then we blame the parents and i go you know look they had no idea what the hell they were doing they if they were aware of what the stuff we're talking about right now they wouldn't have been the parents they were mm. but they were not aware of it they were just playing the same downloaded programs that they got it's very interesting i was giving a talk in israel uh, and um, we uh, bust in uh, three busloads of, of um, um, uh, Arab Muslims from the West Bank mm -hmm. to come to this program. And it's interesting because usually the Jews and the Arabs don't mix at that level. Mm -hmm. But in our big, uh, we had like 1,500 or 2,000 people at the lecture. And uh, what was so interesting about it was I go through the whole story about how the programming occurs and how much of the programming is playing. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to tell them, you know, that is the problem. And, and then I, and I say, that is the problem. I, I'm using PowerPoint. I push the button to the next slide. And it's a big black screen. It says the problem. 
And then immediately two images show up. One of them with Israeli kids playing with machine guns. And the other is Arab kids dressed up, kids in military uniform carrying like wooden guns uh, 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 as if they were soldiers. Mm. And I said, this is the problem. Mm. These kids are, what are they learning? That they hate the other people, that war is going to be, you know, the necessary way and we're going to play with guns and we're going to kill and we're going to be in an army and all that. I go, you're training these kids to hate other people when they were born, they didn't even know other people. And in the early stages, when you said, those people, the ones we hate, even the kid doesn't know who the heck you're talking about, but learns mm -hmm. the program. And the program is, I hate Arabs. I hate Jews. I go, uh, who's an Arab? Who's a Jew? Kid doesn't even know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they say, oh, that's an Arab. And all of a sudden, now that person gets connected to the program, and now we have hate. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I said, your problem is you've been perpetuating violence to these kids from the time they were infants to hate the other side and that war is the resolution mm -hmm. so that was the picture called the problem and then the next slide i push the button black screen but in top it says the solution and then two pictures show up one with two girls an arab girl and an israeli girl walking uh hand in hand and uh, you know and talking and you know obviously just uh, enjoying each other and the same thing with an arab boy and a jewish boy uh playing together and i said this is a solution because if if you play with your <laughs> with the other people and you start to recognize they're just like you i mean what the heck does a kindergartner know from who's an arab who's a jew who's good who's bad they're playing with each other mm -hmm. and if they keep playing with each other and they get older guess what they'll always play with each other yeah. versus the first picture, give me the guns and let me show you about war and then we'll talk. And it's like, wow, you should have, you, if you would have heard the silence, <laughs> hearing the <laughs> silence, uh, basically because I just got into the, pro, the story about how you get programmed and that 95% of your life is a program. And then I showed them the program and they were like in a moment of stun because it all of a sudden it goes, oh my yeah. God, yeah. what the hell are we doing? Uh, and then showing the solution one was, yes, <laughs> this is the way out. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, uh, and it's kind of wonderful because uh, we were there supporting a kindergarten that uh, has Arabs and Jews and Christians, kids, kindergarten, playing together with Arab, Jewish, and Christian teachers, uh, all in harmony, all playing together, all working together. Those kids growing up don't know uh, mm. the nature of war and hate. They, they're friends. Uh, yeah. you, you don't ask your friend, oh, what religion are you? Who cares when your kids are playing in a sandbox? <laughs> you know? It's, uh, funny, uh, it's funny you yeah. say that because it actually reminded me of a story now when I was a youngster. One of my best friends was a black guy and, uh, you know, coming from an apartheid country, one of my uncles or someone said to me, but why are you playing with that guy? I'm like, I literally for a long time never understood. I, I was like, but this is my mate, you know what I mean? And, uh, and just because he, his patterning had told him a certain story, now he expected it to be my story and I never understood. And only later on, I'm like, oh, I understand now because of, your, because of apartheid and all that. But when you're a kid, you don't even know it. Right. And so if we want to resolve the world's problems, we start with teaching the kids. Mm. Yeah. And then I go, well, now you, uh oh, I got a little problem with that because then who's the teacher? Well, the adults you teach, and I go, yeah, but the adult themselves are misprogrammed. And 95% of the day, 5% of the day, I'm going to be the best conscious parent ever. I'm going to teach my child love and health and harmony. <laughs> I'm going to be the best parent. I go, yeah, but only 5% of the day are you behaving that way. Unconsciously, 95% of the day, you're going to play whatever programs that you got downloaded with. And I say, why is it relevant? Because the infant records 100%. <laughs> And so it'll see the 5% where you're being really nice, but it'll also download the 95% that you don't even see you're playing, and they have recorded that, and that will perpetuate the problem to the next generation. So, yeah, I want to work with the kids and make sure they get a great upbringing. Well, then, darn it, I got to make sure my own behavior is good, because if I'm the model for that child, and I'm only modeling 5% of the time a good, a good conscious behavior, then what is the child getting 95% of the time? Uh, and all of a sudden, so, well, I want to help the children, but then first I think I better help myself.
Yeah. It's, and, it, sorry, it, it's like, it's so simple, but yet it's so complex. Um, wh- what is the actual, actual solution though? Because this is definitely not going to change, you know, in any time soon. Is there sort of a solution or do you just kind of accept that this is part of being human? No, this is the wake up call. This is, okay. we, we didn't talk about this and everything would go on just the way it's been going on every day anyway. It will perpetuate itself as it has done for generations. But now the wake up call says, wait, do you know you're not operating your life from your wishes and your desires? You're operating from the program. Uh, and, and so let's just take a moment here just because it's like, well, wait a minute. The programming started before I was born, last trimester of pregnancy, and occurs through age seven. So uh, I say, hey, hey, uh, Gareth, Craig, uh, tell me the, the download program you, you got when you were zero. Huh? Mm-hmm. I, I wasn't there. Okay, how about when one? No, I, I still wasn't there, really. <laughs> Who? No, I can't tell you that either, really. Uh, mm. About three, you might say, oh, yeah, my parents were a little like this. And four and five, it gets a little easier to see. But, hey, you were being programmed before you were born. And mm. the idea is this. Right now, if I ask you what the heck your program is, you're going to say, I don't know what my program is. Why? I wasn't there. And now mm. come. So this is the important message for everyone out there, including myself. This is why I do this every day of my life. Uh, the, the important message is this, is that no I don't have a conscious recognition of the memory because my conscious brain didn't kick in until really age seven. Uh, so then I say, well, then what is my programming? And that's where everybody goes, oh, I don't know what the program. I go, wait, I'll tell you what the program is. 95% of your life comes from the program. The point, your life is essentially a printout of your subconscious programs. And I go, well, what does that mean? I go, well, here's the simple way. Just look at your life right now and and say this. Everything you like that comes into your life comes in because you have a program to support that being there. But, and here's the big one, everything you want and desire, but you have to work hard for, sweat over, put a lot of effort into it, you know, just like, man, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I go, (laughs) point, if you're working on it and you can't get there, easily inevitably it's because your subconscious program doesn't support that conclusion so all of a sudden you know if you're looking for a relationship and you keep struggling it's not really working 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 then guess what underneath is a subconscious program is sabotaging relationships your conscious mind is seeking that's wishes and desires seeking relationship five percent of the day and unconsciously 95 percent of the day your programs are going to sabotage all your relationships and that's why they disappear. That's why they get lost. And you're going, what, what happened? It all started out so beautifully, and then it all went to hell. Mm-hmm. I go, because uh, uh, it turns out, and this is really exciting, mm-hmm. when a person falls in love, and it doesn't have to be with another person. It could be with a pet. It could be with farm, you know, gardening. Person who loves mm-hmm. to garden. Person who loves to cook. When they have something that takes their 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 intention and their joy and all brings it together, something they love to do. It turns out when you're in that love phase, um, you stop playing the program and you stay what is called mindful. You stay conscious. So I say, so what does it mean? Simply where we were just in discussion. I go, you get bad programming, relationships suck, and, you, you, you know, and, and you're not finding some relationship. But someday you find one person. And all of a sudden, you fall in love. And your life could be blah, 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 blah every day. And then the, the day, 24 hours, you met this person, and you fell head over heels in love. I Guess what? The next day is like heaven on earth. Life is beautiful. You wake up, you're in joy. Everything's great. The food's great. The music's great. Life is wonderful. And and you're feeling that I'm in love. Well, that's called the honeymoon. And the honeymoon is you manifested the equivalent of heaven on earth. The day before you met this person, I say, how's your life? He goes, "Eh, eh." and then you meet the person. And then the day after I say, how's your life? He's like, oh, it's so beautiful. (laughs) And then I go, well, what the hell happened in 24 hours? And now science has recognized what it was. When we fall in love like that, 
we stop defaulting to the subconscious. We keep our hands on the wheel, the conscious mind, which is wishes and desires. And instead of 5% of the day, it's over 90% of the day. Now you're creating your life based on your wishes, not on your program. And what was your wish? Heaven on earth. And what did you create? The honeymoon. Heaven on <laughs> earth. Uh, uh, and unfortunately, uh, so just to close this one, it doesn't last for most people for a very simple reason. The reason it was working is you stop, uh, you know, defaulting to the subconscious program, you stayed in control, but inevitably over time, you still have to do more thinking. You still got a job, you got responsibilities, you got chores, whatever it is you got to do. And the moment you start thinking, guess what? You let the conscious mind lets go of the control. And all of a sudden, the programs that you didn't play during the honeymoon, the <laughs> programs when you were in love and everything was beautiful, when you were being creative, all of a sudden, you start playing these negative programs that you didn't play before. And remember this, when you're playing these programs, you don't see it. The other people see it. And I said, what was the consequence? Well, the honeymoon was based on you being the creative wishes and desires person. And then all of a sudden, at some point, you start thinking, and then you start playing these old behaviors that never played during the honeymoon because you didn't play those subconscious programs. And all of a sudden, you start playing these subconscious programs. You don't even know you're doing it because this is the way you've always done anyway. You didn't know you were playing the programs, but now you're playing the programs after this honeymoon. I go, well, what's the result? I go, your partner is observing you. And observing all of a sudden, like, where the heck did that program come from? Who are you when uh, <laughs> your partner sees these negative behaviors that they never saw before because you didn't play them? That was called honeymoon. <laughs> Creative <laughs> moment, no program. So uh, just to, to summarize very, very quickly, uh, the movie The Matrix uh, is not science fiction. It's a documentary. <laughs> Everybody's been programmed. Uh, and every day we wake up and take the blue pill and then life is exactly the way the program was. And then there's a day where you wake up and take the red pill and you get out of the program. And the fact is now we know scientifically the equivalent of falling in love, uh, is equivalent to taking the red pill. I say, and what was the result of falling in love? Your life radically changed in 24 hours and you became someone different. And the idea was, guess what? That was always available, except that we were unconsciously defaulting and playing these programs like Bill, not seeing them. And these programs are sabotaging us. And the moment you stop playing the program, you manifested heaven on earth. So what does it mean? Heaven on earth is always here. It's only the damn program <laughs> that keeps us from experiencing it. Hmm. Fascinating stuff. <laughs> I actually thought the I thought actually the blue pill made re, uh, relationships better. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, it's really fascinating that so so the, obviously the million dollar question is then like okay how do we stay in the honeymoon phase? Well, uh, it's very difficult. People say, "Oh, stay mindful." I say, "Stay mindful." There's so much going on in the world that how can you not help but start thinking. Whether you, what are you going to do next? What did you do yesterday? How did that compare to whatever that? You're thinking about all these things all day. So they say, stay mindful. I go, yeah, that's a great idea, but it's a really difficult process in a world where you're being barraged with so much stuff to do. Staying mindful is difficult. So there is one profoundly important resolution, and that is changing the program. <laughs> and if you rewrite the program to manifest your wishes and desires, rather than the program you downloaded from other people that take away from wishes and desires, you rewrite your program. You can do it. Hmm. And guess what? The 95% of the day when you're defaulting to the subconscious, if the subconscious has the same wishes and desires as the conscious mind, then it doesn't make a difference which one's in charge at the moment, conscious or subconscious. They're both going to play the same kinds of behaviors that you want in life. You could have a honeymoon every day of your life if you rewrite those challenging subconscious programs that take you away from that. Uh, and so the idea is this, that's where personal empowerment comes from. If we don't rewrite the programs, then we are not being personally empowered, we're being empowered by the program. But the program came from other people. So we, had, we didn't contribute to that. 
And those people didn't answer your wishes and your desires. So whatever program they downloaded will not necessarily take you to that destination. But rewrite the program and now you are the creator. Now you are free. Now you can program what you want and it will manifest itself easily as compared to the struggles that we face day to day right now. So, so Bruce, what is something practical that you can do to rewire the program? Well, first you have to understand that the two minds, conscious and subconscious, have different functions and they learn in different ways. And that's the critical point. They don't learn in the same way. And this is where problems come from. I'll tell you why. The conscious mind is creative. The subconscious mind is habits. Uh, 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 just to dis, uh, take, take away the belief subconscious is evil. They're like, oh, that's where the evil comes from. <laughs> I go, it's a, it's, a, it's a machine that records programs. The machine is not evil. The programs can be evil, mm. but don't blame the machine. Uh, I mean, uh, let's give you a positive aspect of subconscious. When did you learn how to walk? Before you were two. Do you ever have to learn how to walk again? My God, you could be 100 years old. You're still using the same subconscious program you got when you were two. Mm -hmm. So, you know, driving the car. Uh, once you learn how to drive it, you don't have to relearn how to drive it. Now it's permanent. Okay, so uh, this is really cool. So difference between the two, conscious is creative. So by definition, that's where your wishes and desires are, creative. Uh, subconscious is habitual, just plays program. Conscious mind being creative can learn in any number of ways. Listening to this podcast, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, going to a lecture, reading a self-help book. This will educate your conscious mind because that's how it learns, creative. Any way you, you can just go, aha, I got a new idea. Conscious mind got a new idea, creative. Subconscious is habit. A and here's the point about a habit. You don't want it to change every day just because you read something new or something. I learned how to walk. What the heck? Do I want that to change? Absolutely not. <laughs> so the idea is this. The habit mind resists change. So you can educate the conscious mind, which we always do, and we're all so smart in the conscious mind, but it rarely translates into the subconscious program. Mm. Uh, and the reason is this, because the subconscious learns by, uh, well, three ways very quickly. First seven years was uh, hypnosis because we were in theta. Conscious mind wasn't even working. Whatever we observed went straight into subconscious program. Mm -hmm. Hypnosis. That's I can talk to your subconscious. Okay. So if we get into hypnosis, we can change it. Uh, very, very, very briefly. Um, every, uh, the vibration of the brain changes from when we're sleeping at the lowest vibration to when we're actively at work, which is a high vibration beta. Uh, and when we come home, that vibration calms down as we relax. So it's called uh, alpha, which is calm consciousness after we start relaxing. And just as we're falling asleep, the conscious mind disconnects. And then we're into the lower vibration, theta. Uh, and so just as you fall asleep, conscious mind's gone, but subconscious is still there. So if you put earphones on as you go to bed, putting a program that you want to be true in your life, and you repeat this every night, just put the earphones on, put in the self-help program, go to bed, conscious mind's falling asleep, gone, subconscious is listening and downloading a program. And if you repeat this, this is how you can do self-hypnosis, okay? Mm -hmm. Step one, okay? Step number two, after age seven, you can add new programs, how to drive a car. <laughs> you didn't learn that before seven. I go, how did you learn how to drive a car so that you can drive it without thinking about it? Because today, if you've driven the car for a while, you get in, put the key in, uh, and you're driving to a store, let's say, and you're not even thinking about the driving, you're thinking about what you're going to get at the store. So I say, well, if you're thinking about getting at the store, then who's driving the car? I go, subconscious. It knows how to drive. You taught it. It knows. And so what's the point? After age seven, you can put new programs in, but you do it through a process of repetition, habituation. You want to learn how to play a music instrument? Well, the damn thing, you have to pick it up and practice it every day. Mm. Practice is repetition. You want to learn something? Repetition. So uh, um, uh, just to uh, uh, use the uh, current new age phraseology, which I find kind of funny, <laughs> is if you want to change your, your life, fake it till you make it. <laughs> Meaning what? Uh, let's say I'm not happy, but every day, all day long, whenever I think about it, all day long, I go, oh, I am happy. Even if you're not happy, I don't care. You just say, I, I am happy. I am happy. Why? <laughs> Repetition. 
And I say, yeah, but subconscious mind learns from repetition. So there's a point of repeating that every day, a number of times, and then one day you'll wake up and guess what? You won't even have to say it because the subconscious mind's now got a program, I am happy, and the function of the mind is to manifest the program. So if I have a program, I am happy, once it's in there, I don't even have to think about it because the subconscious mind will then manifest the behavior to create happiness for me without thinking. Subconscious, mm. 95% of the day. So you can change uh, using uh, a repetition mm. uh, 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 and, and repeating a behavior that you want to be true, even if it's not true, just repeat it. Because once downloaded, then the function of the mind is to make it true. That's how it works, okay? Mm. Uh, so that's the second way. The third way is uh, a, a new way of changing programs uh, associated with uh, um, something called energy psychology. Energy psychology uh, are modalities, there are a whole bunch of them, uh, that engage a super learning process. You go, super learning? I go, uh, for example, you may have seen somebody read a book by holding up the book and moving their finger down the page. Mm -hmm. As fast as they move that finger down the page, just like that, they've read every word on the page. Uh, so they can stand in a bookstore in about 10 minutes, read an entire book by just turning the page and moving their finger down the page. Uh, that's super learning. If you can engage that super learning process to change a program, then you can change a program uh, in a very short time, even sometimes in minutes. Once you know the program you want to change, uh, the change process itself doesn't take very long. Uh, and on my website, so people are going to ask about this, so here it is. Uh, brucelipton.com website, brucelipton.com. Uh, under resources, there's about 25 of these energy psychology modalities that people can get a few lines about what they represent and then connect to a website uh, and, and access uh, processes that allow you to change a program. And the idea is, well, what do you want to change? I go, it's in your face what you want to change. Whatever you're struggling with is what you want to change. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, we have a pathway and opportunity to go into that subconscious mind, rewrite it. And the moment we do that, we have a new life. Wow, that's Amazing. so powerful. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. funny, it made, me, it made me think of a book. Um, it's called The Magic of Thinking Big by, I think it's Schultz. And it's so funny because he, in that book, he, he, one of his teachings is to say, whenever someone says, hey, Craig, how's it going? That you must just be over the top. Like, I'm incredibly, I can't even believe how amazing my life is. And like, and he does this and, you know, and then people think it's strange, but he, he says, if you just keep doing that, eventually you just start to feel like my life is pretty darn good. And right. uh, that's great advice, isn't it? <laughs> oh, it's absolutely. Because if I said to you, so, okay, don't tell me that line. Tell me your truthful line at that moment. Oh, well, it's not going so good. That's it. This and this and this. I go, well, now you uh, have fallen into the program again. Yeah. So uh, it's exactly what we're talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. Put in what you want by repetition, habituation, uh, hypnosis, energy psychology. You put those programs in. And once they're in, this is the cool part, you don't have to do any more work the rest mm -hmm. of your life. Because now that the program you want is in there, you'll operate from that 95% of the day. And then the beautiful part is, well, if you didn't make it exactly the way you want, well, then reprogram it again. You can keep reprogramming <laughs> it. So uh, this is the freedom uh, of saying, look, uh, I got programs in the computer, uh, but I want to bring them up on the desktop. I want to edit them and put them back into the system again. Uh, this is the mechanism of uh, rewriting subconscious because it's just like rewriting the program on your mm -hmm. computer. Can I ask quickly while we're on that about affirmations, is that sort of something similar or do, do you have any? Yeah, well, it's something similar, but it has to be repeated at a very, you know, at a practice level. It's sort of like people say, well, an affirmation is like a sticky note on the refrigerator. I go, yeah, but a sticky note is a suggestion. It's, mm. not, an, uh, it's not a process. So you're not doing anything with it. You just walk by and go, oh, yeah, that's an important point. And then you walk out. <laughs> and I go, so what? <laughs> Uh, you need to repeat it in an exercise. So just uh, an affirmation is nice, but if, if you want to make it work, <clears throat> then you need repetition. Uh, it's a practice. Uh, the more you repeat it, the more you repeat it, the, uh, that's how the subconscious learns. Habituation, make it a habit.
Hmm. And Craig, you know what? It's so interesting with what you just said there, uh, because when I used to walk into the office and like ask, you know, these English guys, because uh, because Bruce, we're both from South Africa actually, and, and obviously I live in London, and I'd always go, "Hey, how's it going?" And they would go, "Not too bad." And I would always think, "What? Why would you say that? Like, why would you say I'm not too bad?" But like, literally, everyone I, I think in England is programmed to answer like that. And I'm like, "This this makes sense. Why you guys are maybe not that happy, you know?" Like, but in South Africa, we're always like, "Yeah, I'm flipping awesome," you know. And it's, um, yeah. it's that repetition yeah. of what you're telling yourself every single day. Yeah, <laughs> cool. a, a little shout out to Rodriguez, the the movie Searching oh. for Sugar. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> that was one of the, the most blow away movies I've ever seen. I mean, the first half I'm going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow. A true Cinderella story. <laughs> you know, life one. It, was, it was one of the most amazing uh, videos I've ever seen of, yeah. of, about this person who was so powerfully important. And, and there he is working as a laborer in, in the U.S. without any knowledge that a whole country had based some of their evolution on his work. Amazing. I then, suggest everyone see that. Searching for Sugar Man. Great. And we, we were in that, you know, we, when I, I had no idea about that only until fairly recently. I mean, we, we, you just, you'd listen, everyone had the Rodriguez, uh, Rodriguez CD and, and, you know, and it was yeah. just part of our life. It was, it's quite a crazy thing to imagine. Part of the yeah. programming. Yeah, that's a, it, just a, a miracle that that movie's just a miracle movie and that's why it's so uplifting yeah. totally uplifting yeah yeah totally totally and bruce so you said some good words which i think are important to the story that you're telling and, and you, you you said the word science a lot and um a lot of you know everything that you've done that you do is is based on science um and you actually written this amazing book here uh, called The Biology of Belief. And it's, it's truly amazing. So thank you for, for writing that. And uh, you, you write a lot about it, uh, something in particular called epigenetics. So yes. maybe in like you know, a couple of minutes, you could just briefly explain for people what that actually is and, and why it's important um, for everybody. Okay. And, and you've already kind of said a lot about it, I guess, in, in the way. So we'll, we'll give a, the brief version. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> All of us uh, have been programmed uh, through school with a belief in genetics. Uh, and there's a phrase, uh, that, that thing, that disease, that dysfunction, whatever, is under genetic control. And what that means is simply this, is the belief that we were programmed with is genes provide the characteristics of our life, and also that genes turn on and off so that uh, you're not involved with that. <laughs> so as your life is unfolding, you're more or less a victim of genes controlling your biology. So when something is, this character is under genetic control, literally means it is controlled by genes, not by you. Since um, uh, we inherited the genes, and we don't know, you know, we, we have no knowledge that we selected these genes. So, uh, you know, it's like, well, we got a bunch of genes and these genes control the character of my life and I can't change the genes. That's the story. Uh, then all of a sudden I say, oh my God, my whole life is predetermined by these genes. Oh, there's a cancer gene in there, an Alzheimer's gene. And it's like, ah, I'm a victim. So mm. that is victim. My research revealed that uh, genes are just simply blueprints. Uh, uh, and I say, why is that important? And I say, well, you go into an architect's office and she's working on a blueprint and you ask the architect, is your blueprint on or off? And she'd look at you, you're crazy. It's a blueprint. just no on and off. I go, precisely. <laughs> the gene is a blueprint. It does not have an on and off to it. It is controlled by an environmental signal. And all of a sudden this changes everything because the new science is not genetic control. It's called epigenetic control you go epi that's a little what's that's that i go well skin is called epidermis i say what does that literally mean well below the skin is dermis epi means above so epidermis means above the, the dermis skin epigenetics uh, epi means above so when i say the new science epigenetic control it literally reads control above the genes and I said, well, what's the above? Well, it's the environment, and more importantly, our perception of the environment that controls the genes. And I said, well, significance of that? And I said, the most profound significance is this. 
In genetics, we're victims of genes. In epigenetics, since we can control our perceptions and since we can control our environment, then we become masters of the gene. So the new biology from genetics to epigenetics is going from victimization to mastery. And it says, if you understand this, then you're, you're not a victim of your genes, you're manifesting your own genetic expression. And you can change genetic activity. So even if you come with a mutant gene, you can, through your perceptions and your environment, change the readout of that gene to read normal. So in other words, while genes are blueprints, perception and environment are like uh, architects that can adjust the blueprint. Mm -hmm. And once you understand that, then we become very powerful entities and not victims of our heredity. We can change any of the genetics. Uh, and this is what people need to know because if you're programmed to be a victim, then you anticipate, oh my God, I'm going to get this, or I'm going to die be young because my dad died young, or I'm going to get breast cancer because my mom got breast cancer. Uh, and it's like, no, <laughs> the genes don't control that. We control the genes. And once you understand that, then we surely, surely move from the victim of heredity <laughs> to the master of life. And, and this is what the new science epigenetics is all about. Oh, well put. We, we're not a slave to our, to our genes. And that's, that's such a great way to, to think about our, and a very empowering way to think about our, our lives. Maybe, Bruce, you could just explain sort of some of those experiments. So in other words, you would, you would have these stem cells and you'd, and you'd put them into different environments and that yeah. would change. So maybe you could just explain how you'd seen it in a, in a practical way on a cellular level. Okay, but very simply it's this. Um, uh, a human body is not a single entity, it's a community of 50 trillion cells. And so when I say me, that's Bruce, that's a word for 50 trillion cells under my skin, okay? Uh, every day we lose hundreds of billions nat naturally, just skin cells slough off and blood cells are dying and stuff like that. Every day we lose hundreds of billions, but fortunately we have what are called stem cells. Stem cells are just embryonic cells and they can replace any of the dying cells so that even though you're losing hundreds of billions of cells every day, you're replacing hundreds of billions of cells. So uh, do you have stem cells? Well, if you're listening to this conversation, the answer is yes, <laughs> because you're still here. If you didn't have stem cells, you would have died a long time ago. So uh, <clears throat> I have these, these uh, stem cells, embryonic cells. So my experiment was to isolate one stem cell and put it in a Petri dish all by itself and the cell divides every 10 hours about. So first there's one cell, then there's two, and then four, and then eight, and doubling every 10 hours. So after a week of just putting one cell in the Petri dish, I have about 30,000 cells in the Petri dish from doubling. Hmm. I go, most important point, all the cells are genetically identical because they came from one parent. So I have 30,000 genetically identical cells. But I split those up and I put 10,000 cells into each of three Petri dishes. So I have three dishes, but all the cells have genetically identical uh, cells in them, mm. okay? All the dishes. But I changed the combination of the culture medium. Culture medium is the laboratory version of blood. So when I grow human cells, I say, well, what's human blood made out of? And then I make synthetic version called culture medium. Mm -hmm. But since I'm making it, I change some of the combination very slightly. So I make three different versions of culture medium. The cells grow in the culture medium. So the culture medium is environment. And so I have genetically identical cells, but in three different environments. And in one culture dish, the cells form muscle. In the second, the cells form bone with a different environment. And a third, again, a different culture medium environment, the cells form fat cells. So the question is this, what controlled the fate of the cells? Were you gonna say genetics? And I go, no, nope. why? They're all genetically identical. So the fate, whether it was muscle, bone, or fat, wasn't determined by the genes. They all had all the same genes. It was determined by the environment hmm. that the genes were in. Uh, and, and this is the research that led to the new science called epigenetics, which is a science that says the environment controls our genetics. You go, well, that was a, a study of cells in a plastic Petri dish. What the hell does this have to do with me as a human being? Mm -hmm. I go, we have 50 trillion cells under our skin. So I say, relevant? The human body is a skin-covered Petri dish with 50 trillion cells <laughs> in it. And it has your original culture medium, blood. I go, and what about that? And I go, well, it doesn't make a, this is the point. It doesn't make a difference if the cell is in a plastic dish 
or the cell is in a skin-covered dish. Its fate is controlled by the culture medium. The plastic dish, that's the culture medium I create in the laboratory. In your skin-covered dish, you have the original culture medium blood. So I say, so what's relevant? I say, the chemistry of the culture medium determines the fate of the cells. So I say, well, then the chemistry of your blood is controlling your biology and your genetics. I go, yes. Mm -hmm. Then you say, well, who's the chemist? I go, well, the brain is the chemist. That determines the composition of the blood. And then the last and most important question is then, but what chemicals should the brain put into the blood? And I go, the picture in the mind is translated into complementary chemistry. A picture of love has different chemistry than a picture of fear. And all of a sudden I say, oh, well, then the brain is the chemist is going to adjust the chemistry based on what? The picture in the mind. So if you have a program of negative, then the chemistry that's coming out is going to be negative. If you have a positive vision in your mind, then a positive one's going to come out. And I say, well, the chemistry determines the fate of the cells. So if you change the picture in your mind, you change the chemistry, which changes the genetics. Hmm. And all of a sudden it says, oh, my God. I'm not a victim of the genes. It's the picture in my mind. And that's, I said, where'd you get that? Well, it's 95% of the subconscious programming, uh, which we run by, are programs that other people put in. So when I take a program my dad taught me and I'm operating from that, then I'm making chemistry that is complementary to that program. And if it's not a positive uh, program, then I'm going to make negative chemistry. So basically, our biology is a complement to our consciousness. Hmm. Change okay. consciousness, you change biology. And you go, whoa, that's so new agey. It's not, that new age is a hardcore science. But hmm. more importantly, to emphasize this, the most valid science on the planet, the most valid, truthful, all the sciences on this planet is quantum physics. It's been the most tested and the most verified of all the sciences. And I go, and <clears throat> what's <clears throat> fundamental? And the answer is this. Quantum physics primary principle, consciousness is creating your life experience. That's the principle. And what's interesting is epigenetics is the biological correlate that reveals a mechanism by which consciousness creates our life experience. So quantum physics and epigenetics are the same story. Hmm. Uh, and if we understand this as the most powerful thing is, if you're not, life isn't happening the way you want, health issues, relationship issues, job issues, we have a tendency to look in the environment and say, it's not supporting me. And now we turn around and we say that quantum physics and epigenetics reveal that the experience that I'm having is created from right here. And if the experience isn't right, I don't change out here. I change in here. And then the experience is manifest. So this is the empowerment that this world needs right now is to, hey, you're not a victim of anything other than your program. And if you change the program, you become a master, a, a, a person who creates their life. And that's, if, if you thought the honeymoon was a good idea, imagine having it every day of your life for as long as you live. Yeah, it's an important one. It's all in your control, people. Let's, uh, yeah. let's be conscious of that. But it's, it's also very interesting, like, like listening to you speak about this now, because now it's something that people grasp and people are following and, and believing. Um, but actually, from you know, listening to some of your stories and interviews that you've done, when you first gave you know, talks on this to like, your fellow colleagues and stuff, they kind of were like, are you like going a little bit crazy, Ruth? <laughs> you know? oh, so, absolutely. You know, yeah. because there was a, a, a conscious awareness of the science that I was doing in the laboratory, the conscious awareness about the composition of the culture medium uh, relative to con com you know, composition of the blood relative to the consciousness creating that. And I put this together and said, oh, my God, if you change your consciousness, you can create a whole you know, new life, a wonderful life. Um, so the beginning, it was just in my conscious mind, creative mind. I saw the results. It was like, oh, my God, we can be powerful. So I wanted to bring some people in to say, look, let me show you this new science, because if you understand this new science, you can create the most fabulous life. And as I start giving a lecture, they look at me and go, 
you know, Lipton, <laughs> your, your life doesn't look that good for a guy who says you know how to do this. <laughs> and that's when I realized, oh, my God, I'm talking the talk, but not walking the talk. Mm. That led me to the understanding that even though my conscious mind was fully aware of all this, I was not operating from that mind. I was operating from the subconscious programs. Once I started to change the subconscious program, then everything I talked about manifested. Hmm. Uh, 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 and, you know, uh, I haven't had a, uh, you know, a personal doctor since 1990. And I didn't even have one then. That was just because the insurance at the, <laughs> my job at the school paid for it. When I left the university and no insurance, uh, I said, well, I don't have any health insurance. And so I consciously had to say, well, you can't afford to get sick now. So mm. there was a consciousness that said, sickness, mm -mm, can't have it. Well, I can't afford it. And uh, as a result, I haven't had a doctor in, you know, nearly 30 years now, <laughs> you know, and no pharmaceutical drugs at all, because I have a very negative impression about that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually wanted to ask you about that. So, so we, you, you mentioned earlier, we, 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 health comes from within basically, you know, like the, it's inside out rather than outside in. And, and Absolutely. We, we tend to live in an outside in sort of a world. Um, but how do you kind of find that middle ground uh, in, a, in, a, in a real world sense where you can, um, you know, feel like you want to be positive, but, uh, but sometimes you, when do you, you know, do you know what I mean? Where do you draw that line of when do you well, go to see the doctor and how do you take the pills or whatever? <laughs> well, it's very simple as this is the moment you find a struggle is the question. Why am I struggling? That's the first question. Why am I having trouble finding a relationship? Why am I having trouble staying in health? Uh, uh, rather than going out and asking the universe, Hey, what are you guys doing out here? That's not giving me it's no, no, go inside <laughs> and say, mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Uh, I am manifesting this uh, struggle. And I said, well, how do you want to get out of the struggle? I said, well, put in a program that is completely the opposite of the struggle, the one that you want. And, and as I said, you, you know, you can put in the program three different ways. Uh, and once you download this, then all of a sudden, 95% of the day, you're operating from a new program. And if that program is one of health and happiness and joy and all that kind of stuff like that, then without even any effort, it's still same biology. I'm only working at 5% of the day driving the vehicle. 95% of the day, if my autopilot is taking me to my destination, I don't even have to think about it. It's mm -hmm. automatic. And that's the beautiful resolution. It's like, oh, do you have to struggle your whole life? I go, no, once the program is changed, work is done. So while we sorry while we're talking about health, right? Um, there's obviously you know you have so many people around the world that are involved in health, and they're, they're saying this is the most important thing. That's the most important thing. So I always sort of used to think like, okay, nutrition was the most important thing. But then like more recently, understanding sleep, I'm like, okay, sleep's like probably the most important thing. Um, and but now listening to you, there's this this whole sort of um, programming of your conscious and, and unconscious mind or subconscious mind. If you had to rank these things, you know, what, do number you, one, you could be able to one, rank them. Number one, consciousness. Number one, the idea is this: you want to talk about nutrition. I say, well, okay, let's talk about breatharians. Who are breatharians? Well, these people presumably nothing but you know even if they have some crackers or something that's not like what we eat they virtually have no food and they're healthy and happy so all of a sudden the idea is that i have to have the correct nutrition it's like how about no nutrition that works pretty much too because we can trap energy out of the environment like plants trap sunlight uh humans and animals can trap uh, electromagnetic fields uh and take energy so breatharians are just downloading uh we we use uh right now conventional education says oh uh, biology gets its energy from mitochondria and mitochondria take food and break it down and make atp which is an energy source and we say oh that's why food is so important for staying alive and then it turns out recent research has suggested that only 10 percent of uh, energy that we use in our body is actually coming from food that 90% of the energy is coming from the environment through uh, pigment granules called melanin. I go, why is it relevant? It's like, 
I, I didn't have to even eat the food. I could just download the energy. And I go, that's evolution, man. Evolution doesn't make an organism that evolves to the extent that it destroys the rest of the environment to stay alive. Evolution is to make a smaller footprint on the environment and look at the, the way we've manifested the, the environment right now. We're destroying ourselves. We're facing an extinction due to human behavior. For what? Undermining the environment. Mm. And the reality is, guess what? It all starts here. At all, so everything after this is a cascade down here. You can try to adjust down here, but if you didn't adjust up here, then it's irrelevant in the end, really. You yeah. know, uh, as I said, uh, cancer, there's no cancer gene. There's not a gene that causes, there's not one gene that causes cancer. You know, well, then where the heck did the cancer come from? I go, you know, it takes about 14 genes to get the cancer off the ground. I go, 14? I go, what's the coincidence that accidentally 14 genes that were perfect had to hit the same place to get to the cancer? And I go, it wasn't an accident. It was an unfortunate consequence of programming, like the child that got adopted into the family and has the cancer. And I go, why is this relevant? You can treat the cancer down here. You can chemotherapy. You can do radiation. You can cut it out. You can do all that. And I said, if you didn't fix up here, inevitably you're just going to manifest another cancer the cancer isn't the problem the cancer is a symptom of not being in harmony with life uh, and in fact uh genes count for less this is the fact genes count for less than one percent of illness and if you understand that fact then the biggest issue is that where the heck is 90 plus percent of illness coming from mm. there it is so, so and just the off the back of though, surely and yeah. the environment though like it it, it must also environment come, yeah. yeah but but no but then if you put the environment over consciousness you still then made a mistake for a very simple reason hot coals can burn me that's a fact uh, i i would not want to step on any hot coals okay but in the right consciousness you can walk across the hot coals and not get burned so all of a sudden I say, well, the environment has got hot coals. It should burn me. I go, yeah, but explain how consciousness, which is manifesting our life experience, was able to allow you to walk across the hot coals. If you're not in the right consciousness, don't walk on those hot coals. And if you think that's something, uh, I also talk about in my programs, um, in the South in the United States, there are fundamentalist religious people that go into religious ecstasy and talk in tongues, whatever strange this, you know. Uh, but what's interesting is that they testify. And testify is a word that means I will do something that's so stupid <laughs> for ordinary people, but I will do it because I know God protects me. So I am protected. And I say, like, well, well, walking across hot coals, this one playing with snakes, they're snake handlers, so they play with very poisonous snakes. And even when they get bitten, they don't really have much of a problem. Every now and then, one of them does die. But the ones that I want to talk about are some of them drink strychnine poison and testify that God protects them. So what's their belief system? Before they drink that poison, they have a belief system, unshakable, that God is going to protect me. They drink strychnine in toxic doses and don't have any adverse effects. And all of a sudden you go, but wait, the real world says I drink strychnine, I'm gonna die. The real world says I walk on hot coals, I'm gonna burn myself. I go, these are examples of how consciousness overrides the environment. And the significance is consciousness is everything. And then I go back to say, hey, what do quantum physics say? Consciousness is creating the whole damn experience. You want to change the experience? You don't change the world. You change consciousness. The world then changes after that. It's, it's, it's fascinating. You know, I, I think there's a question I'd like to ask off the back of that. And, and I guess it's a bit of a tough question to, to frame, but what about children that get sick? And, yes. And, and yeah. you know, like how, how can it be that they're okay. programming at such a young age? Okay. Programming occurs of a child in the following way. Epigenetics says the culture medium, the blood, uh, signals in the blood control genetics. I go, yeah, but guess what? The fetus is not living off of its own blood. The fetus is, is using the information in the mother's blood. So the placenta brings the mother's blood in. Nutrition from the blood goes and nourishes the fetus. Yeah, but so do uh, signals 
like what? Chemicals such as hormones, uh, emotional chemicals, uh, growth factors. This is also in the blood. So as the mother is uh, feeding, in a sense, the fetus through her blood going into the placenta, she's also providing information. And if her world is a struggle world, the, the, the information of the, the stress hormones and all that, it's not just in her body, but going into the body of the fetus. And epigenetics says that the information in the blood is going to control the genetics of the child. So there's a level of contribution from the mother's life experiences. Is she being supported by the husband? Is she supported by the world she lives in? Does she have fear about the future of her own child? I mean, if there's enough fear, a woman can't even really get pregnant because mm -hmm. the system will say, no, we, we, we can't grow this child. This isn't going to work. Okay. Uh, and, and so there's an issue about this. And I say, well, so then the mother's role, that's one. Number two is uh, we have to also recognize that we have an identity as personal identity that is picked up by a set of what are called self receptors that are different for every human. No two humans have the same set of these membrane receptors, antennas, receiving an identity. Each of us is receiving a different identity because we have a different set of antennas. I say, well, what's the point? Well, the body is like a television set. It's got an antenna to receive a program. And so you're watching the Bruce program right now. But if the, you're watching a TV show and the TV breaks, we say TV is dead. And I go, yeah, but is the broadcast still there? And he says, of course the broadcast is still there. So I'm going to say the human is like a television set. This is my TV, the Bruce TV. Okay, the signals of Bruce are actually coming from the environment being picked up by what are called self receptors. So it's the broadcast Bruce and the television Bruce. Well, the television Bruce could die. Bruce is dead, but the broadcast of Bruce is still there. And if a future embryo shows up with the same self antenna, self receptors, then you're back, but in a different television. Uh, 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 and that's called reincarnation. But, and it's interesting, people have to know this. It doesn't make a difference that television is male or female. It doesn't make a difference that television is white, black, brown, red, yellow. That's the television. We are not the television. We are the broadcast. And that, that in physics is called a field. But a field has the same definition as spirit. Field and spirit, same definition invisible moving forces that influence the physical world. That's a definition of science field, but it's the same definition of spirit. Mm -hmm. So uh, science is revealing to us that we're a bit more than just these bodies and, uh, uh, and that uh, we are an eternal field mm -hmm. and the bodies come and go, the field is here. Sure. It's, it's amazing. Like I, I totally, am like on your wavelength and, and I just, you know, subscribe to everything that you're saying. Um, I'm just, I can only imagine though that, the, that there's like a certain bunch of people, I don't know, scientists maybe as, or whoever it is that, that like literally go, no, I'm sorry, Bruce, this is still a bit too far fetched. And there's a lot of pushback. Like, like I'm sure there must be that. How do you, how do you handle that? And what do you say to these sort of people? Or do you even science, get that? Science is science. And if they don't believe it, that's fine because that's also a belief system. If everything's based on belief and I believe I can do it, I can walk across the coals. If you are afraid and you think you can't walk across the coals and you do, guess what? You're going to burn yourself. And all of a sudden you start to realize, I say, so what about people who are skeptic? I go, well, they don't believe stuff. I go, well, then fine. Their life is based on their belief. It will not work for them. And I'm not saying that's anything wrong. That was a choice. They choose what to believe. Uh, and so uh, you can have a belief not to believe. Fine. Skeptics. Oh, that's all a bunch of crap. I go, fine. You, you live your life. I'm enjoying my life. <laughs> Why? My, my belief is a, is a bit different than yours because I'm offering myself mastery. You're denying mastery. And therefore, you have to live the consequences of that. I prefer to live the consequences of the one that I have. Do I argue with these people? No. Why should I argue? If their belief is it doesn't work and it's based on belief, then for sure it's not going to work. And they'll prove it every day about it doesn't work. And I go, yeah, <laughs> you're right, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. uh, it's classic. But, but do you have maybe any real life examples of people really changing their, you know, their conscious minds and like their belief systems and these sort of things? 
the whole thing is called the placebo effect, okay, and nocebo effect. And uh, I have to conclude because we're running out of time here. Okay. But let me let me just say this: the belief system is is in daily life recognized uh, as its influence in the placebo. I said, what's the placebo? I said, well, here's a doctor. He's got this brand new pill. You're suffering from an illness. You get this doctor telling you about how powerful this pill is and everything. And it's going to be the perfect cure. And you get into it and you take the pill and you get better. And then you find out it was a sugar pill. And I said, well, what healed you? Well, not the sugar pill. Your belief in the sugar pill. That's called placebo effect. And placebo effect works all, you know, one third of all medical healings minimum is all due to belief system, one third, okay? Uh, now the problem is this, placebo effect is the result of a positive thought. This pill is going to heal me. What if I gave you a pill and I said, listen, uh, this pill is gonna cause this disease and I'm punishing you, I'm gonna give you this pill hmm. and you have to take it. And you take it, guess what? You can get the disease. What was it? Sugar pill, I know we have it. Uh, voodoo, <laughs> sugar pill. It's the same mechanism. What? You bought a belief. We talk about placebo. That's positive results of positive belief. But we don't mention negative belief. I go, why is it relevant? It's equally powerful to positive belief, but it works in the opposite direction. Uh, a placebo can cure me from a disease. The negative belief called nocebo can cause any disease. Just because I believe I could have a cancer, I can get a cancer. I can die if I believe I'm going to die. And all of a sudden I go, it's the power of belief that controls it, positive or negative. We mm. never talk about the negative, and unfortunately, 70% of our life is, is misdirected by negative belief, and we ignore it. And I go, don't ignore <laughs> negative belief. It's shaping your life just as much as positive belief will shape your life. So mm. all of a sudden, uh, uh, this puts us into uh, positive and negative belief uh, as being what controls us, either one. So uh, belief controls. If you don't believe it, then it's a negative belief and it won't happen. If you do believe it, then it's positive belief and it will happen. That's the conclusion. And, and if we own this, then the first thing you have to do when we finish this conversation is say, what the hell do I believe? <laughs> because if that's your belief, that's your manifestation. Except that your wishes and desires are positive beliefs you would love to have, but then only 5% of the time can you attribute uh, your biology to the conscious belief system. Yeah, we've got to get our heads in the right place yes. uh, and, uh, and start with that. And, and that's a way to, to re help uh, programming with our children and stuff. You have to start with yourself so that you know you're imprinting them in the right way, I guess, as well. Absolutely. And, and yeah. So, what excites you about the future, Bruce? And uh, what are your plans? And also maybe off the back of that, you could just repeat where people can get a hold of you and contact you. Uh, okay, well, let's start with brucelipton.com. That's simple because everything we've been talking about is available information on the website. There are articles, videos, audios, all kinds of stuff to reinforce everything we've been talking about. My belief is simply this, that right now we're facing an evolutionary upheaval. We, uh, as a human population, have made an unsustainable situation, uh, forcing what is called the sixth mass extinction of life, which will include us. Uh, I see us on the knife edge. Can we make it through this extinction or not? I go, it all depends on how quickly we can own our consciousness as creator. Because if we collectively turn the world around with new consciousness, then the world turns around. Uh, and so we're on the edge. Uh, I'm going to live as many positive days as possible because I know that my life is fantastic after reprogramming. I had to do the reprogramming just like anybody else. But now that it's done, everything's up. Everything's great. Health, happiness, joy, uh, honeymoon. I live on a honeymoon. And this is available to all of us. Uh, but we have to go back and, and emphasize the nature of of programming and uh and changing program and okay. that that's really the whole point of all of this beautiful that's cool bruce and bruce just before we finish off with uh, with our last question that we'd like to ask um all of our guests i'm just wondering is there is there anything maybe that you haven't mentioned that uh, that people can maybe wake up tomorrow and go, let me add this to my life it's going to really be life changing and and what i you know i'm also thinking around 
you know, do you have any thoughts on things like say plant medicine, for example, like, I don't know, you using ayahuasca or something to, to tap into these. The, these are uh, plant medicines and, uh, and hallucinogenics are very interesting because they also free you up from the, the program that you're in. All of a sudden your mind gets bigger than the program and you could see a bigger world and all that. And a lot of people can get there through the medication. Uh, some people uh, do it the old fashioned way of, you know, uh, uh, spiritual practices and all that. I don't care which way you get there. But mm. the idea is to ultimately recognize you are more than this body and this program. Because once you own that, then you have the ability to manifest more. And that's mm. what the whole secret is. Cool. Brilliant. Good question. And, and so, Bruce, the last question here uh, we like to ask all of our guests, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Living the most wonderful, joyous, happy honeymoon experience on the planet. When you really understand who you are, you wake up not with a foreboding of, oh my God, what's going to happen today? You wake up with the, wow, what's going to happen today? That's a completely <laughs> different approach with two different resolutions in it. So ridiculously happy in this case means that you can wake up and manifest what other people thought was ridiculous. It's not ridiculous if you know the mechanism, and that's the whole idea. We have been misprogrammed to believe we are victims, but once you identify you are the creator, then why not create happiness to the ridiculous level? And in doing so, enjoy heaven on earth. That was why we're really here. And uh, having touched it, boy, am I, you know, I, I spent... 40 plus years on the other side. And, uh, and since then it was like, Oh, wow. I wish I knew this when I was 20, mm. <laughs> I'd have that many more years of this joyful, healthy, happy life. And I want to thank you for this opportunity to talk to your community about that because everyone who picks this up, if they start creating heaven on their own, then collectively the whole planet will manifest heaven on earth. And that's what I think the destination is. So uh, thank you, Craig, Gareth. Thank you both for this opportunity. And, but I especially want to thank the audience because the evolution is really based on every individual out there who wants to make a change. Uh, no, it's not passive, it's active. We are either going to make the evolution or we're going to fail and become extinct. So here's the choice time. Yeah. Thank you. Bruce. So just so real cool. briefly, I just wanted to say thank yeah. you so much for, for your time today. It's, it's been incredible. You are just a wealth of knowledge and, and literally almost can't keep up with that brain of yours. It's so <laughs> it's uh, really fascinating. And uh, let me just say also personally, thank you. I think some of your principles in my own health and my own life uh, have improved it uh, in terms of my mindset and, and knowing that things are happening. You're not a victim, you know, and, and that's just literally at the end of the day, that's like one of the most powerful things that anyone can learn. We're not a victim to anything. We decide how we turn out. And so I just want to thank you personally as well for that. Um, but we are very grateful for you today and uh, thanks for coming on today. I appreciate it. And thank all of you and our audience. Awesome, man. Sorry, just two okay. seconds from me. Sorry, but I just, I just want to say like huge thanks for, for coming on the show. Like everything you say is really resonates with us and um, you know, it's, it's really in our control, everyone's control and you bring such a great energy. So thanks so much. And it's been a pleasure to chat with you. Thanks a lot, Bruce. Thanks Gareth. So appreciate it. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, 